All right, guys, I'm Nicolette. And today, Brian and I are here with Doug Stetson. He is the CEO of Freefall Aerospace. And he's going to talk to us today about some of the new innovative antenna technology coming out of the company. And uh, Doug also has a long history at NASA. So we're going to learn a lot from him today. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate your time. Oh, it's great. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, looking forward to talking to you. Um, so thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so I'll just go ahead and uh, tell you a little Not bit about far. what we're doing. Um, sure. Nicolette and Brian, thanks a lot. Um, my name is Doug Stetson. I'm the CEO, president, uh, part-time janitor, you know, <laughs> stuff around the office. I mean, that's one thing you learn if you have a startup is uh, basically everybody's got to do whatever needs to be done. Um, so Freefall Aerospace, uh, we've been around, um, actually formed the company in 2016. So it's been about four years. We really got serious about it uh, about a year after that. Mm -hmm. And um, we are a spinoff company from the University of Arizona, located here in Tucson, Arizona. And um, we are developing new technology for antenna systems, and in particular for small spacecraft, uh, for ground stations, for 5G internet systems, all sorts of um, different uh, antenna technologies. <clears throat> the, um, the core technology that we started with was invented by actually the co-founder of the company with myself is a professor of astronomy here at the U of A. His name is Chris Walker. And uh, Chris works primarily in um, terahertz astronomy, very high frequency radio astronomy, uh, using high altitude balloons that they fly from Antarctica, uh, taking large, heavy telescopes up to very high altitudes, basically near space, uh, to do their uh, astronomical research. <clears throat> so in working with Chris on some of his projects, uh, we realized that um, a lot of the technology that he was developing for his astronomy research would have a lot of applications for uh, communications, radio communications, and in, in particular for small spacecraft. So we figured out how to uh, miniaturize uh, basically the technology that he was working on, um, got a contract with the um, Office of Naval Research to do a study and eventually uh, got another contract with the Air Force to build a prototype of this system. And so things kind of took off from there. Um, my personal background is um, in uh, space systems engineering. Uh, I spent most of my career, almost 30 years, at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab, <clears throat> working in the planetary exploration program, worked on um, several of the outer planets missions, the Cassini mission to Saturn, Galileo mission to Jupiter, um, a number of the Mars rovers, uh, which are still going on. Uh, so had kind of a, a long uh, career there. Um, never had any intention when I left JPL, never had any intention of, of starting a company. In fact, I, I swore I would never again have employees or have to worry about all of the, you know, the bureaucracy that's associated with that. But when I got together with Chris here in Tucson, <clears throat> it was clear that the um, technology he was developing could be so valuable that uh, we really wanted to jump into it and, and uh -huh. things kind of took off from there. So that's sort of the origin story of, of the company. And it's, uh, it's been quite a ride so far. So you keep saying small spacecraft. Are we talking about like, you know, putting people in space? Like, like, uh... <laughs> no, <laughs> no, we... pe no people, no um, people. No people. Uh, so actually, uh, I mean, if you follow the space industry at all, mm -hmm. you hear the word CubeSat all the time. And that's kind of all the rage in, in uh, has been for the last decade or so. And um, a CubeSat is, is a spacecraft that's composed of a series of cubes. Mm -hmm. um, they're 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters, and they are stacked up in a kind of a modular fashion to form a spacecraft. And, and you know, one of the kind of the um, standard designs is what we call a 6U or 6-unit CubeSat. And that turns out to be just about the size of a toaster oven. Uh, but it is a fully functional spacecraft. Um, lots of the miniaturization that's gone on in computers and electronics and sensors has made these small spacecraft very, very capable. And they're very attractive throughout the space industry because they are so low cost, lightweight, they're cheap to launch, they're easy to replace if they fail. Uh, they originally started as, as uh, student projects, basically yep. learning uh, uh, programs for, for college students primarily. But they've really become kind of the standard in space science, in uh, DOD space activities, a lot of commercial space. Right. But they have a fundamental limitation. 
And it's really a conspiracy, I call it, between physics on the one hand and engineering on the other that prevents these very otherwise very capable small spacecraft from being able to transmit large amounts of data to the ground. They cannot, they don't have the real estate to uh, package and deploy large rigid parabolic reflector antennas. Uh, they don't have the power available to, uh, to use um, the what's called a flat panel phased array antenna, which larger spacecraft are, are using. So that was really a bottleneck in the in the utilization of these small spacecraft and that was the problem we set out to solve and so the way we solve it is by using an inflatable antenna it's the material is basically the same as you know a party balloon you'd buy at safeway for your kid's birthday it's, it's a mylar balloon mm -hmm. um, and we can package that into a very very small volume inside a cubesat or other small spacecraft when that gets into orbit, that can deploy and provide a very large aperture, up to one or two meters diameter aperture. And that's the key, is a large, very lightweight aperture that can be easily deployed from a small spacecraft. Uh, it is that large aperture, large diameter antenna that allows us to pump down a lot of data without having to pump a lot of power through the system. And that's the way we kind of break that log jam. So that was really the light bulb moment, you know, when we started this company, we realized that uh, this is kind of gives us the sweet spot between a standard parabolic antenna and a very high power, you know, steerable phased array. Uh, we can get the best of both worlds in this in this uh, technique. Right. So that's that's kind of where we are. So I know NASA was at, at some time because I do remember what you were talking about where they were doing a very student based and it was it was called cube was a cube sat and it was like those cube cubular sat. satellite right sure. um, pieces exactly. that that were launched out. So now this is what we're talking about because those were like I don't know maybe like this big and they would use mm -hmm. like people would use like cell phones and things like that in them to communicate mm -hmm. right if sure. I recall how yeah. that program worked. Mm -hmm. So this is this is sort of like this is. Those were just to go up, get some data, come down, whatever, be, mm -hmm. you know, into the into the ether. So now, what are when we talk about small crafts? What are what are these things mainly doing? What are they being used for? There's a huge number of applications. Um, everybody knows Elon Musk. Oh, well, I mean, not personally, but if you read the paper, <laughs> if you read the yeah. internet, you know what you know about yeah. Elon Musk. If you comment so, on this video, we'd be grateful. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. No. Yeah. So, um, you know, he's putting up these constellation of thousands of small yep. spacecraft. And the, the, the goal there is to provide global internet coverage. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, people don't realize, I mean, we use the, um, we're using the internet right now. We use it all the time. We take it for granted, <clears throat> but a huge fraction of the globe still does not have regular or reliable access to the internet. We call that the digital divide. And it's a real problem. I mean, billions of people around the world don't have the kind of information capability that we take for granted today. So one of the ways to solve that is by putting in space a network of small satellites. They have to be small so they can be low enough, sufficiently low cost um, to uh, provide that kind of coverage 24-7, 365 throughout the entire globe. And that's really what the Starlink program that uh, that SpaceX runs is is doing. But they're not the only ones. There are, I don't know how many other companies, maybe a dozen, that are going down that same path. Some have tried and already failed. One was called OneWeb that uh, was doing very well, but couldn't monetize the program, went bankrupt, but now they've been resurrected by another buyer. So, you know, the, the value of... Um, providing this uh, uh, global communications coverage, whether it's internet or cell phone or, or just other, other data streams uh, throughout the world uh, is, is huge. And um, so that's one of the primary drivers for the utilization of these small spacecraft. And the good thing for a company like us, every single one of those spacecraft needs an antenna. That is the only way they communicate. The better the antenna, the more data they can put down at lower power, lower cost, they win. And that's how we win, is by supplying that advanced antenna technology. Um, so anyway, that's just one example of the way these uh, CubeSats or other small spacecraft are, are being used. Uh, the um, DOD, the Department of Defense, military, 
is on that same bandwagon. They, they are interested in putting up networks of small spacecraft for their own purposes, um, observation, communications, uh, data taking. Um, these spacecraft can be used for remote sensing, for monitoring the Earth, uh, weather monitoring, for example. Uh, one of the programs we're working on is, uh, is looking at using a constellation of small spacecraft for uh, high precision radar observations of, of Earth. Uh, so, uh, and then from a scientific point of view, um, small spacecraft going to other destinations, the moon, Mars, near Earth asteroids, other deep space destinations, uh, you know, that's, that again is, is kind of the, um, uh, the watchword right now is is small, low cost spacecraft, but they have to be very capable, and that means they have to be able to provide a lot of data, and that's where mm -hmm. we come in. Well, I have a question about the data. So, when when you talk about the capabilities that this new intense technology unlocks, compared to what's been previously available, how does the data differ? differ? So, w what are you capable of providing before, let's say, this? Yeah. New technology what kind of data were they able to tap into and how does that change now the data is the same is actually you know all data is just ones and zeros they're just right. bits but what we can do is give you more bits per dollar and right. that's really what it boils right. down to and so a typical small spacecraft a cubesat is is the word we use a lot will have uh, since they're so small uh, they'll carry very tiny antennas little patches or little whip antennas that have very low data rates and so they can provide you know a hundred um, kilobits per second or, or something, you know, and, and there are other techniques to, to increase that um, up into the megabits and even gigabits per second. So that's the key is, is you need, I mean, if you want to provide uh, internet coverage, if you want to stream video, uh, any of that, you need, you need a data rate, you know, bits per second that is very high. And that's really been the limitations. And the way we break that, as I said, is providing a basically a big fat pipe. And that's what the antenna is. It's just a large pipe that lets us pump out a lot of data. The larger the pipe, the less power you have to put through it to pump out the same amount of data. And power is really one of the fundamental limitations for anything that's done in space. Uh, it's very expensive to provide large amounts of power for spacecraft. They have to use solar panels, they have to be deployed, they have to be pointed at the sun in the right direction. It's very complicated. So minimizing the power, minimizing the mass of spacecraft is, is the um, kind of the fundamental challenge of anything that is done in space. And also when you think about it, the only reason anything is put into space ever is to send data back down to earth. Right. I mean, otherwise, those things are no good. If you can't communicate with them, if they can't right. tell you what they're seeing, <laughs> what's the point? And right. so that's where the antenna comes in. So you, you, you mentioned, you mentioned, you know, we, we, we all, you know, we all talk about, you know, colonizing Mars and, you know, the moon and things like that. And, you know, it's fun of the, some of the fun stuff, but what's the, okay, so we have these antennas, right? And we're, we're beaming, you know, we're beaming information back down to earth. We're sending that data back, right? So what's sort of like the distance? Like, is there some sort of like, how far are we going? Because eventually we're going to have to go satellite to satellite to satellite as we get sure. further and further away, right? So what's sort of the distance or the communication, you know, distance you, you actually could sort of work with? with this? Well, you know, I mean, it all gets down to, you know, what, for example, the, the Voyager spacecraft that were built at JPL back in the day um, are still flying and they are in interstellar space. They, you know, if you, I don't know how old you guys are, I'm old enough to remember, but, uh, you know, they were launched back in the 70s. <clears throat> it flew by Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune um, and then out into interstellar space. And they are still communicating from those huge distances. Now they have an antenna that I forget, it's about two meters in diameter or something like that. Um, very small transmitter as you know, the, the, the transmit power on those spacecraft is about the same as the light bulb in your refrigerator. So very small amount of power and they trickle back the data, but you know, they can, we can still communicate with those spacecraft. Now it's very low data rates. It's, it's tens of bits per second. But that's enough to get some scientific data and monitor the health of the spacecraft. So it all depends on um, how much data is really required. Um, you know, if if we if we were, had been able to provide a larger antenna 
on those spacecraft, even at those large distances, we'd be able to get you know, more data from them. So the technology that we're developing will allow small low cost spacecraft to go to planetary destinations such as the moon, Mars, and potentially even farther than that, and still provide the amount of data that would be the equivalent of a much larger, much more expensive spacecraft. Yeah. <clears throat> and so that's why the value proposition for us from a science point of view, from an exploration point of view, is, is really order of magnitude increase in the amount of data that can be provided by these small low cost spacecraft. And again, everything boils down to cost, you know, if it, the gut, yeah. Yeah. And then, so then it seems actually like if you sort of daisy chain them, right, you had them communicating with each other, you get further out and keep those dairy rates up. Or... You could do that. I mean, that's something that we are actually working on that um, for right, Earth there you orbit. Go. You join the team. You're, you're... <laughs> yeah. No, it's a good idea. Um, but the challenge there is, uh -huh. you know, every spacecraft is moving with respect right. to every other right. spacecraft. So they're all in orbit, they're circling around. So being able to transmit from one to the other to the other, it's a complicated sort of operations uh, problem to, to get the view periods right. Uh, right. So, you know, the simpler way is communicate directly to Earth. We have large antennas here on the ground. Uh, some are up to, you know, NASA Deep Space Network, 70 meters in diameter. These are large antennas. Um, and so they can collect a lot of data, uh, but they're very expensive to operate uh, with our system. <clears throat> putting that large lightweight antenna out in space, we can communicate at the same data rates with smaller ground stations, which means there's more of them. They're much cheaper to operate. Uh, so the whole total uh, sort of total cost to get the data down decreases. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think for, for planetary missions in particular, we're really excited about the potential of this technology. We're uh, in negotiations now with a company, <clears throat> excuse me, that is... Um, sending a small spacecraft to the moon under a NASA contract. We may be able to uh, put our antenna systems on one of these lunar landers uh, here in, in fairly short order. Um, so we are actively pursuing that. And we're also looking at the possibility of putting a uh, basically an orbiting relay, a data relay spacecraft in orbit around the moon mm -hmm. uh, to communicate with the astronauts or the other exploration systems on the surface of the moon and provide that data again at very high data rates back to earth. So we're talking to engineers here and what what would you say in your opinion um, you know engineers should be thinking about as they're designing future you know maybe it's future spacecraft or future parts for craft mm -hmm. what what would you say they should be thinking about right now? Well I you know um the sky's the limit. I mean, no pun intended. The sky's the <laughs> limit. I mean, with with the the types of capability that are that are out there today, sensors, uh, imaging systems, um, spacecraft computing capability. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of of uh, new science that can be done. Um, but you know, and anybody who's in this business realizes, you know, space space is hard, and hard means expensive, mm -hmm. and um, Keeping the cost down is has been the challenge from the get go. I, I you know I can remember back uh, when I was working at JPL. <clears throat> you know we were in the era of what we call the flagship missions, and these were billion dollar class missions to the outer planets, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, for example. And you know the way the budgets have changed, um, it just gets harder and harder to justify and get the funding for these billion dollar class uh, projects that span usually it takes a decade or more to design and build one of these uh, large expensive systems. That means it spans more than one presidential administration, a whole number of Congress uh, congressional um, inputs. So keeping a program like that on track over a decadal time scale was always hard. And in today's environment, it's even harder. And so I think, you know, for future programs, cost and, and, you know, schedule are really the drivers. So we need, we need projects that can be done in relatively short periods of time, ideally within one presidential administration for years, so that people don't keep changing priorities on us, which happens all the time. And, um, keep the cost down to something, something manageable. And that's why these, this, uh, the whole industry has, has pivoted, uh, 
to, in large part towards these small, low cost spacecraft CubeSats mm -hmm. being one, one, one key example. Mm -hmm. So that's really the drivers. There's a tremendous amount that can be done, but if you don't keep your eye on the cost and the schedule from the beginning, um, then the chances of ultimately getting the thing launched and, and having a successful mission are right. getting smaller and smaller. So Doug, you're, you're from California, correct? So yep. And, and Freefall is located in Arizona. Yeah. Now, was that decision based on a co-founder? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was actually kind of a tough decision because um, I still, I mean, my wife works in, in California. We still live in Pasadena near JPL. Mm -hmm. So I'm back and forth all the time. And that's been even harder here during the pandemic times. Um, yeah. So um, when we formed the company, yeah, there was a decision to make, uh, you know, located in California or keep it here in Arizona. We, we chose to stay here in Arizona. I'm really, really glad we did um, because the proximity to the university is, was certainly probably the number one driver. Uh, my co-founder, the expert in the technology, the inventor of most of it is Chris here at the university. Um, we've hired a number of his grad students as some of our key engineering employees. So they can, you know, they were there when these systems were invented and, and so, very seamless transition into our company. That was, that was very simple. Um, but in addition, uh, you know, in particular where we are here in Tucson um, has a really vibrant and growing uh, sort of high tech um, <clears throat> capability. A number of companies are locating here. Uh, you know, it's cheaper to operate by quite a bit than in Southern California. So that's a good thing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a, it's been a more of a challenge for myself because I'm sort of in two Different. locations and I always got to keep track, even though the time change is only an hour, it's enough to screw me up. On meetings and, stuff. And, and Arizona is the one state that doesn't change. So sometimes you're probably in the same time zone, right? <laughs> that makes it actually, that makes it even harder. I wish, you know, so, but juggling that is one thing. Um, so, but no, I, I think from the company point of view, it actually was kind of a no brainer uh, to mm -hmm. stay here Um there's a very supportive uh, sort of a startup community here in Tucson. The, the local community has, there's an organization called Startup Tucson that has, has shares a lot of information among uh, small companies that are just getting going. So we've learned a lot that way. We made some really good, strong partnerships. Uh, so that the kind of the vibe here uh, was, was a lot less kind of cutthroat than you might right. find elsewhere, Silicon Valley or Southern California. Um, and we got a lot of support from the local sort of political uh, community. Um, so yeah, it's been a great uh, place to have a company located and get started. And it's, uh, it's been really exciting. I didn't know that about Tucson actually. Yeah. Yeah. No, you should come out. It's a great spot. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm there on the next plane. I'm in New York. I, I, I'm okay. Coming. Right. <laughs> yeah. Especially, so, especially um, it's cold here right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah it's cold. Yeah, so the company is now currently we have, um, I think, 12 employees, 12 full time employees. And, you know, we have partners and consultants and contractors that we use to, to fill in the gaps. Um, we've been able to raise some um, funding. We had a, a, a venture capital uh, organization located here in Tucson. It's called UA, UA Venture Capital, and they're chartered specifically to invest in companies that are commercializing technology that was invented at the University of Arizona. So we were kind of one of the poster child companies for, for that. So we were very fortunate to get connected early on with uh, UA Venture Capital. They gave us the seed funding that we needed to get up and running. Um, one of the things you learn when you start a company is there's, there's this thing called founders funding which means, you know, reaching into my wallet on a regular, <laughs> on a regular basis uh, to keep the company going, which I've done. Uh, we brought in what's called friends and family funding. So mm -hmm. it's, it always helps to, to have friends, maybe from college, which I did, who went out into the world and made a lot of money and were happy to invest in, in our little company. So, you know, you pulled all of these pieces together and that's really the key is to get started. And, and then we were lucky enough to get a couple of contracts um, with uh, primarily with um, government organizations, NASA and the Air Force and the NRO. That kind of got our wheels going under us. <clears throat> and then, you know, then we've 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 hooked up with a few other commercial uh, larger companies that are interested in our technology and are moving that forward, too. So. 
um, you know, I couldn't have predicted when we started, uh, you know, what, how, where this was going to go. Uh, but really, because of the value of the technology and, and the fact that it's really filling an, an, an important gap mm -hmm. in the space industry, um, that's why we've been successful. Uh, and, um, you know, we've got a long way to go. I mean, it's always with a small company, you're always sort of hanging on by your fingernails, but uh, that seems, seems to be the law of nature. And, and so we're, we're doing okay. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, uh, that's, uh, that's kind of, um, and the future, you know, I, I think uh, we're, we're teaming up. And Doug, that was my next question. Okay, where, well, yeah, kind of you got it. <laughs> well, yeah, so uh, where are we going? Well, um, you know, the challenge for us has been to, and the reason we need this early seed funding <clears throat> is when you have a new technology, you've got to prove it. I mean, yeah, we can write view graphs and, you know, put stuff on paper and say, well, how great this is. But until you build something and demonstrate it and prove it, uh, that's the only way to, to, you know, to really break out. And that's expensive. I mean, building hardware and testing it is an expensive thing. So that's why we needed this, this early seed funding. Um, uh, so we are in the process now of completing our, what I would call completing our prototype demonstrations. We have a, a project which is supposed to launch uh, in September of this year, we call CATSAT, CATSAT for the University of Arizona Wildcats. Um, it's a, it's a, a partnership between our company, Freefall, and the University of Arizona. And it'll put into orbit a 6U CubeSat, toaster oven size, including our inflatable antenna system. And that will be kind of the first uh, critical demonstration in space of the value of this. We, uh, we've, we've demonstrated here on Earth, in the lab, and on outdoor test ranges. But until you get this thing into space and prove that it works, uh, that's, that, that, that's really the gold standard. And, you know, the other challenge for us is it has, we have to prove not only that it's better than what else is already out there, but it has to be a lot better, uh, an order of magnitude improvement in, you know, performance and or reduction in cost is really the standard for a new technology because there are antennas out there today. I mean, spacecraft are up there, they're communicating. Um, and it, in order to encourage uh, customers or users to switch to a new technology like ours, you got to show it, it's, it, it's not just going to be an incremental improvement, it's a revolutionary improvement. And that's what we're shooting for. So um, the near term is, you know, we have our CAPSAT spacecraft. Uh, it's, it, the spacecraft is here. We're getting ready to launch, hopefully in September. That'll be a big step. <clears throat> we're also building um, ground antennas that are based on the same fundamental technology, which can provide much better performance at lower cost uh, for antenna systems here on the ground. And, you know, antennas are everywhere. I mean, there's so many of them around that you hardly even notice them anymore. Either communicating point to point antennas, you know, communicating to one another here on earth or communicating up into space. Um, so we're handling kind of both sides of that, both the space-based portion as well as the ground portion based on the same fundamental technology. So again, we're building our prototypes, testing and demonstrating uh, this year for both the space and the ground systems and um, building the partnerships, customer engagement, really, that, that we think is going to really have this, uh, you know, take off. So this is the year for our company. I mean, 2020 was... Uh, kind of a lost year for everybody, but um, uh, you, we made a lot of progress and 2021 is the time when we'll complete these demonstrations, get things really, uh, really rolling. And, and uh, you know, we think it's a very bright future uh, because of the, of the value of this, uh, this type of system. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's interesting too, because I think 2020 in some weird ways put a lot more people interested in space again, you know, with everything that went on with some of the stuff that Elon Musk was doing. So I, I don't know, sure. it seems like there's a real renewed interest, you know, where it sort of petered off. I mean, I've always been interested, but it sort of seemed to like peter off a little bit in, you know, yeah. and I feel like it's, you're seeing a lot of revival of it with all the stuff mm -hmm. going on. I think so. And again, and again, it's because, you know, um, and Elon Musk is, you know, like we say, the poster child of, of mm -hmm. this, uh, but there are others, you know, a lot of very rich guys decided to start space companies, yeah. um, you know, and there's there's old jokes about, you know, what's the best way to make a million dollars in space is to start with $10 million, you know, because, <laughs> because, you know, it's hard and, and things, things 
you know, you have failures, but, um, right. but, but uh, yeah, I think there is a renewed interest and it's, it is partly because of the recognition mm -hmm. that um, space provides a venue to allow this global connectivity. And if there's one thing that kind of defines, you know, society today, at least, uh, you know, in, in our, in our world, um, it's connectivity. I mean, we're, we're talking to each other right now on Zoom and, uh, you know, we've been doing that. That's the only way anybody's been able to work, you know, during this crazy year. Um, but it's, it's that connectivity that is the key. And what is connectivity? It's data. It's moving data back and forth. The better, more efficiently you can do that, the more connectivity you have the glo and and then making that global is um is something that i think people really resonate with the, with the value of that so yeah i think that has captured a lot of the imagination um the reusable systems again that spacex has, has shown the reusable rockets is fascinating you yeah. know and and that is really a paradigm shift in the whole space industry everything trying to bring the cost down and if you can do that, bring the cost of the flight systems down, the cost of the launch systems, the cost of the communication systems, then space really becomes accessible to everybody. And I think that is kind of, you know, at the front of, of, front of mind of, of a lot of the entrepreneurs now is, yeah. is capturing that and helping to, to promote that global connectivity. Yeah, it, it's, it seems like the race is who's getting to Mars first, right? Who's getting to Mars on Mars first? This yeah, that's, that's as, important as crazy, too. <laughs> as crazy as it sounds, that seems, to yeah. be the, that seems to be the race. So here's my last question. What's your prediction for that? <laughs> What's getting to Mars? Mars. Getting to Mars? You, Brian. <clears throat> you, work, yeah. you work at JPL, I mean. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, it's true that now with the private space industry um, mm -hmm. in the mix here, uh, yeah. that really is a game changer. Uh, you know, NASA and, and other governments uh, do things at a certain pace. Um, and the parallels with uh, air, aircraft, air, air travel are, are pretty striking. You know, it, it, was, it wasn't until um, private industry got involved in air travel back in, you know, I don't know when it was, the 20s, 30s, whatever, that that technology really took off and, and, you know, investment came in and things started to move much, much, much faster. I think we've seen the same thing and we'll continue uh -huh. to see it in the space industry. So now that um, there is enough financial support and interest right. and people have the staying power and they're not at the whims of, of presidential administrations and, and, you know, Congress messing with budgets all the time, mm -hmm. they can, they can, have the willpower right. to to conduct these decade long kind of programs. And that's really what it takes. So I think, um, you know, there is a really good chance um, that uh, private space industry, Elon, you know, SpaceX being the, the lead, right. uh, will get uh, something in orbit around Mars uh, by the end of the 2020s. I think that's that's highly possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, the target landing date, at least that NASA puts out for humans on, the, on Mars of the mid 2030s. Um, I think that's, you know, again, that's at the whims of the government budgets and, and, and the willpower of, of, uh, of, of leaders in the administration. And that's something that, that ebbs and flows and you really can't predict. Uh, I remember back uh, some time ago, um, you know, somebody had asked me a similar question and I said, you know, I think that to me, the logical date for humans on Mars, uh, actually on the surface, is the year 2069. And I said that because it's 100 years after the first landing of humans on the moon. Uh -huh. And I, I still think that, you know, that's a long time from now. And people don't want to think it's going to take that long. Right. And maybe it won't. But if it did, I think that, you know, posterity would look back on, on this era and say, you know, it was just about 100 years from the first powered airplane flight to landing on the moon. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty good. And then if it was only 100 years from landing on the moon to landing on the surface of Mars, that those guys back in the 20, you know, the 2000s, uh, 2020, 2030, they did pretty good. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, long term, people would look back on that and think, you know, that was that was actually pretty fast in the context mm -hmm. of the, you know, kind of the overall scheme of things. 
Uh, so right. I think the hope is that, um, you know, there will be humans on Mars um, well before that, you know, 2030s, I think, given the investment that's required and mm -hmm. a lot of the technical challenges that have really not been solved yet, I right. still think is pretty iffy. Um, mm -hmm. But again, if there's the willpower, um, you know, uh, and the, and the uh, continuity of budgets across decades, if, if we can do that, um, then, yeah, it, it can be done faster. And it really is going to have to be an international program. I mean, a number of countries are interested in, in pursuing this. And if we can bring them together and do this as an international program with all the complexities that that in, involves, then that's the way I think can, can really build this up. But the wild card is, is the private, um, uh, private space industry. And uh, again, you know, more power to them. If, if that can be done, uh, I think it's going to be fantastic. And, uh, you know, at least so, some, some people, some companies uh, really seem to be committed to it. So I wouldn't bet against them. Otherwise, I'll be sitting down in 2069, and I'll remember this conversation. <laughs> okay, good. Sounds still good. I hope I'm. I hope I'm wrong. You know. I should still be here. I will remember your okay. words. Okay. All right. Well, I won't. So enjoy. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, Doug, we really appreciate you talking to us today. This is sure. this was fun. Was a fun conversation. Can you Excellent. let everybody know where they can learn more about uh, Freefall Aerospace and the technology you're working on? Yeah, obviously, the website um, is Freefall Aerospace. Dot com freefall aerospace all one word um and uh you know people tease us sometimes about freefall why did we choose that name um and the reason is it wasn't actually wasn't my idea but um <laughs> it's because when something is in orbit in space it's in a constant state of free fall that's really what being in orbit is is something happens to be continuously falling is just falling fast enough that it never you know, re-enters an atmosphere. So anyway, that's kind of sort of where the name came from. Um, but yeah, freefallaerospace.com. And that's where to go. Thank you so much, Doug. Cool. Okay. All right. Thanks again.